Good afternoon. This is Joan Qualls from Tasteful Voyages and welcome to this week's episode of From Joan's Kitchen. Today we are going to be making gazpacho, which is a cold vegetable soup, a chilled vegetable soup. There is no cooking involved in this one. This is not a traditional gazpacho. This was my mother's spin on it and I'm really not sure how she came up with this, um, but it's easy. It's faster to put together than a traditional gazpacho and it's really, really tasty and I'm going to go through the steps with you. To make the gazpacho, you need to have some canned tomatoes. Um, I'm using pureed tomatoes. You can use either pureed or crushed tomatoes. The crushed tomatoes are gonna have um, a little bit of a thicker consistency. The pureed tomatoes are very smooth. And I'm gonna be thinning that out with some chicken stock. If you happen to have homemade chicken stock, that's awesome. I'm gonna be using this chicken stock in a box. It comes in a quart box. If you don't want to have um, any animal products in here, you can use vegetarian or vegetable stock as well. Um, and then for flavoring, we have a little soy sauce, we have Worcester sauce, we have olive oil. I have oregano, the powder, uh, not powder, the oregano leaf and garlic powder. I don't put any salt and pepper in here. I leave that to people to do for themselves to taste. And then people may also want to spice it up with some Tabasco or other kind of hot sauce. I don't tend to do that. I also have a can of sliced olives. This is a 3.8 ounce can of sliced olives. And then for the vegetable component, this is gonna have celery, it's gonna have some cucumber, some avocado, and some apple along with the olives. I've gone ahead and chopped up some of the vegetables. One of the things that I like to do with this, if you have the ingredients on hand, is to chill everything before. So my tomatoes and my chicken stock have been in the refrigerator so they're nice and cold already. Um, the vegetables I kept in the refrigerator, the Worcester sauce I keep in the refrigerator. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. And all you do is pour the tomato puree, in this case, into a bowl. And then I'm going to actually pour my chicken stock in here to kind of swish this around to get um, the remaining tomato stuff out of there. And then just go ahead and pour the rest of the, t uh, the chicken stock into the tomato base here. I've already got my other wet ingredients measured out, so I'm going to move these out of the way. So here I'm putting in the Worcester sauce. Worcester sauce is a condiment and it does have fish in it, so if you're a vegan and you don't want to be having any animal products, you can find alternative sauces for this at health food stores like Whole Foods or Sprouts. Uh, it does have uh, fish in it. It also has vinegar. It's a vinegar-based sauce. And here I'm putting in my olive oil. I'm using extra virgin olive oil, and it's a very strong tasting olive oil. Again, these, these things that I'm adding here are gonna be adding flavor to the final product. I've got my garlic powder and oregano already measured out. So that's just gone in there. And I'm gonna give all this stuff a quick stir I find that the celery also adds nice flavoring to the soup, so I usually add the celery first. If I'm making this way in advance, I don't typically add the apples and the avocado until a little bit later, just so that they don't get discolored at all and they're nice and fresh. So let me just move my cutting stuff over here. With respect to the celery, I just wanted to do a little explanation. This that you're used to seeing, this is a stalk of celery. This recipe calls for three ribs. This is a rib of celery. So basically the stalk is a whole bunch of ribs of celery that are growing together. When you're working with celery, you have to make sure to clean it really well because there can be dirt in here. You'll see the bottom of the celery, it's a root that grows in the ground. And without getting too graphic, there's all kinds of fertilizers and things that are used that can get caught up in the dirt. And you just want to make sure that you have it really well washed before you use it in any of your food. That is actually one of the ways that people can get um, food poisoning is from the chemicals and fertilizers and things that are in the soil where our food is grown. So with the celery ribs, I cut them um, in quarters all the way down and then I'm going to chop that up. So I'm going to have just like little bits of celery that are going to go into the soup. Some of the gazpacho soups also would have chopped onion in them. If you try this, you can really add whatever vegetables you might want, keeping in mind that some of the vegetables that might be added 
are very strong tasting and may add flavor. Personally, I don't care for the flavor that onions add into the soup, so I don't put that in. Traditional gazpacho also calls for green peppers, which I also don't personally care for, and that would also really strongly flavor the soup. By the way, if you have any questions while I'm going along, please go ahead and ask the questions, and I will do my best to answer them. And if you're watching this on a tape replay, please go ahead and put questions in the comments, and I will come back and answer them for you. The next thing I'm going to put in is an apple. I actually have two of these. These are medium-sized <coughs> Granny Smith apples. <clears throat> you want to have something that's crisp with a nice flavor because the flavor really does add to the soup. It's unusual to put apples in a gazpacho, but there are gazpachos that have fruit in them. Um, actually, grapes are an ingredient that's in a kind of gazpacho that's a white gazpacho that's made um, with garlic and almonds. Um, I had one of those once. It's a wonderful food memory. The problem is I can't remember where it was that I had it, and I've never really been able to reproduce that, but I'm still working on it. It was something with almonds ground together and garlic and green grapes, and it was a lovely green color with a very subtle flavor, and it was really delicious. So I've cut my apple in half and then cut the cores out. Then each quarter of the apple I've cut into four slices, and I'm just going to break them up into little pieces. I want my pieces of vegetables and fruit that are in here to be pretty consistent in size. And I have my other apple actually already cut up, ready to go into the soup. Uh, traditional gazpacho is very different than this. A traditional gazpacho, it most likely we'd be using fresh tomatoes, fresh green peppers, fresh onions, stale bread, and olive oil, and maybe some garlic, and all that stuff would be either ground up in a blender or even mashed up in a mortar and pestle. Um, and that's a lot more time consuming to put together than this is. And I actually like this version better, probably because this is something that my mom came up with. So this is the kind of gazpacho that I grew up with. A traditional gazpacho also has vinegar in it. And you know, I was thinking that this one doesn't have vinegar, but the Worcester sauce is actually a vinegar-based sauce. So there is a little bit of that that's in there as well. I've got my chopped up apple ready to go in there. And here is the rest of my apple. Now, for the cucumbers, you can use regular cucumbers, the ones that are probably about half the length of this and wider. Those cucumbers, I don't really like to eat the peel. It has a very bitter taste, and they usually have seeds in them, and some people have a hard time digesting the seeds. This is an English cucumber or a hothouse cucumber. You can usually find these in the store wrapped in plastic. And I like to use them because you can eat the peels and you don't have to take the seeds out. There are seeds in there, but they're very tiny and very easily digestible. Um, this is a pretty long one, so I'm gonna cut this up in sections. So what I do is I cut it in half lengthwise, and then I cut that again. And I'm basically gonna be cutting these um, halves of it into quarters here and then chopping that up again. My, my goal is to have the pieces of fruit and vegetable that are in here pretty much the same size so that it's easy for somebody to eat the soup with a spoon. So you'll see that the, pretty much everything that I'm chopping up with, with the exception of the celery is the same size. cucumber has really a kind of a bland flavor but it really is enhanced by the seasoning that is in the rest of the soup and before I chop this one up I'm going to show you real quickly there are seeds in here but they're kind of negligible they're really not formed you can see the seed traces in there but there are really not any seeds if this was a regular cucumber there would be big seeds that were white and formed you could certainly use those cucumbers but you would peel them and then to seed them you would take a spoon just a regular teaspoon and run your teaspoon through the seeds like that to scoop them out but with these particular cucumbers it's not necessary to do that they think that gazpacho actually started uh, with the Romans but it didn't have um, the ingredients that are in a traditional gazpacho today. They think it started with leftover bread and garlic and olive oil and perhaps a little bit of vinegars and water. 
there was water used to moisten the bread. These days, gazpacho is more closely associated with Spain and a little bit with Portugal. And they started adding tomatoes to gazpacho in the 1900s. So most of them do have tomatoes and those are called a red gazpacho, but there are white gazpachos. I mentioned the uh, variety that I had once that was made with almonds and garlic and grapes. So there are a lot of different varieties. Here in the U.S., people make gazpacho out of watermelon, cantaloupe, you know, pretty much anything that you would like to make it out of. And this is, this is kind of a basic recipe that I'm making here. Whatever you would make is really up to whatever tastes, you know, you like. Put in fruit and vegetables that you like. Um, this does have avocados in it. I love avocados. Um, that's also kind of a non-traditional vegetable to add in there. So I've just sliced my avocado around the middle and I'm gonna twist it to have it come apart like that. And I'm gonna hope that this works. You whack it with a knife and then you can pull the pit out like that. And I'm gonna just cut this avocado into quarters and then peel it by hand. I have seen some people who will hold the avocado on their hand and cut into squares with the knife and then scoop out the cut flesh. I think that's too dangerous. The skin's not that thick and you could have the knife go right through the avocado skin and cut into your hand, which would not be a good thing. Um, of course, this skin is not coming off easily. Usually they slip right off. I'm gonna actually scoop this out with my spoon instead, just to get it a little bit quicker here. When you're looking for avocados, in my opinion, the best avocados, they may be the smaller ones, and the skin is almost black in color and it's really smooth. And to find out if an avocado is ripe, the best thing is to just press on it. You want it to have a little bit of give, but you don't want it to be too mushy. That would be overripe. And when they're overripe, they can get black spots in them that are really bitter, and you don't want to eat that. So I cut my avocado into four pieces. I'm cutting each quarter of the avocado in half, and I'm just going to cut that into little chunks. You can see how soft this is. If I was making guacamole, this would be the perfect consistency for it because it's so soft, it would mash up really easily. I love guacamole. When I make guacamole, my recipe is very simple. Um, I just put in salt and garlic powder and maybe a little bit of lime juice and a little bit of bottled salsa. The bottled salsa has some citric acid in it, so it helps keep the avocado or the guacamole from turning brown. And that's it, and uh, people really like my guacamole. I also think my philosophy towards guacamole is you can never have too much because people really love it. So when I do make guacamole, I like to make a nice big huge bowl full of it so that there's plenty for everybody. And I have another avocado here that I had cut up previously. So I'm gonna put that in. And I've got my sliced black olives here, which I have drained. You don't want to put the water that these are packed in with that. So I'm going to give all this stuff a stir. And the last thing that is going to go in here is just a few dashes of soy sauce. As I mentioned before, if you or your family members or your guests like spicy food, you could always serve this with some Tabasco sauce or Tapatio sauce or something like that on the side. Or you could have white pepper or black pepper for people to add in. The soy sauce, again, just adds a little bit of taste to it. I actually don't want to have the whole thing open like that. Let's see. I'm just going to give it a few shakes of the soy sauce, just for a little extra flavor. Again, the flavor of this, it's a very personal thing, so when you make it, you want to taste it. Taste the tomato broth that's in here and just see how you like the taste. You may want to add more garlic powder. You may want to add more oregano. You might want to add some chopped onions. You could always add peppers. It's pretty much all up to you. This is just kind of a base for what you're making. So there is the finished product, the gazpacho. And I want to take a minute to show off something that I made yesterday. Over the weekend, I participated in how to make croissants. And it was from a company that's called Course Horse. It's a web-based learning company. So Saturday evening, I spent about three and a half hours with my computer here on the counter and the instructor teaching and she talked us through making the dough and then mixing the butter into the dough and then the various folds for the croissants and then we got up early on Sunday morning to bake them off and these were the finished products I made a dozen of these and they're delicious and they're beautiful and so I would highly recommend that particular course from Course Horse it's 
course, C-O-U-R-S-E, course, H-O-R-S-E dot com. It's a company that's based in New York and they have courses in all variety of subjects. This particular chef that taught the croissant making class, her name is Eve Bargazin, and she has just a lot of really great experience in New York, and then she was at a resort up in Alaska for many years, and now she's based in LA. She was a really good instructor. There were about 25 people on the virtual class. She was very patient. She was very attentive to monitoring the questions out of the group, and looking at the results from everybody else, it seems like everybody really had beautiful results making these by hand at home. So I would highly recommend that. And I thank you for joining me from my kitchen today. Again, if you have any questions, please pop them in the comment box. And I will be back here again next Monday. At this point, I think I'm going to be making a Mexican shrimp cocktail, which is another light and refreshing thing to have during the summertime. It's something that you may see as an appetizer in Mexican restaurants. It's also very simple to make and very delicious. It's a nice appetizer to serve with tortilla corn chips. So that is it for today. Thank you again for watching, and I will see you next week. Ciao.